I have started the recording. Chad, do you want to present or shall I do it? You're muted. I will present. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to to um, the uh, briefing on um, student poster sessions. And this is really to help you to kind of understand what's, what uh, to expect and what the expectations are for your presentation. Uh, Chad, if I go to the next slide, please. So we'll be presenting three different topics um, for this poster session 101. Uh, as I've mentioned, what to expect and what are the expectations uh, for your participation. Also, Alvaro will go over how to create a scientifically impactful poster, as well as tips and guidance for presenting your poster. And then Nana, Nana will um, talk about opportunities for networking, engaging, and engaging the science and engineering community at the ASGSR as well as um, outside the ASGSR. Um, next slide, please. So as I've said, I'd like to welcome you to the American Society of Gravitational Space Research. We have a set of goals for you um, that we want to make sure that um, you know about what's going on. And, um, you know, they're basically what we want is we want to provide you a professional venue that you can present your outstanding science, technology, and engineering projects. We also want you to gain a lot of experience from interacting uh, with and communicating your science to a diversity of individuals who will be at the ASGSR meeting. This is going to be really important because communication is everything when it comes to science or anything you'll do in the future. If you cannot communicate clearly and accurately what you are trying to do, what you're trying to say, develop, it won't exist. And so you need to really work on and learn how to communicate, both written, but more importantly, also one-on-one -on -one personally. And so this is what we want to give you all the opportunity to develop. Also, we want you to learn about how others discovered their future, future goals and the pathway to their careers as well as how they achieved them and then also considered new pathways that they may have taken. You know, again, the idea is you're just starting, you have ideas, you may have questions on how to get from point A to point B to finally Z. That's all part of the ASGSR and what we would like you to gain. Also, we wanna provide an environment uh, for you to interact with your fellow students. This is really important because they could be your colleagues in the future. Also, it's always great to learn from peers. Um, think alike, you may think differently, but you're at that same level of communication and concepts and ideas. So it's always good to learn from others, but also to learn from your senior peers as well. And then also to obtain a guidance and advice on pursuing higher education uh, for those of you who are, who are undergraduates and are considering going on to possibly medical school graduate or graduate programs. And also, um, how to, how to pursue your career ambitions goals. What are some tips and advices you receive from those who have already done it or who may be early in their career and thinking about changing? So all of these things are what we uh, would like is our goal at ASGSR for your student participation. Next slide, please. So getting the most out of your ASGSR experience and that's, you know, and, and there's a lot gonna go on I think many of you are going to be at the entire meeting this year. I think you've heard that the last man to walk on the moon, Harrison Schmidt, um, will be our keynote speaker on the first day of the meeting on, on November 8th. And we are setting up an opportunity for the students to talk with them um, in the afternoon. But, you know, we're also going to have faculty uh, a bit, uh, opportunities to meet the faculty. And I put high school here, but it really it's open to anyone. Um, that Saturday, November 12th from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, also attend the presentation sessions each day you're at the ASGSR meeting. They're, everything is open to you to attend except the board meeting. You know, so definitely go over and review um, the copy of the program and the schedules and talks before attending the ASGSR 
to familiarize yourself with what you might want to hear, what you might want to do uh, while you're here. So you're not trying to figure it out uh, on the fly. And then again, also attend other student posters and engage them in conversations, but also we'll have faculty and um, who will be presenting posters as well that it definitely you'll want to attend and talk with them and learn. Most importantly, ask questions during your post session, during sessions. Feel free to approach any of the scientists and professors or anyone, NASA attendees that you want to and talk to them, ask them, what do you do? How did you get there? You know, or engage them in your, your own science. You know, walk through the vendors exhibit and talk with, talk with the, the vendors who are scientists and engineers. Many have worked at NASA or as contractors. You know, so, but the key is ask questions, go and talk to people. Okay, that is probably one of the biggest benefits you can get out of going to any meeting or conference is the ability to act one on one with your fellow colleagues, students, professors and others. Uh, next slide, please. We're getting a delay on my end. Here we go. Great. Thanks. Also. One important thing to understand if you don't know already is who attends the ASGSR meeting. It's a huge diverse population. You have NASA in all of its different capacities. You have International Space Agency's representatives. You have IS and scientists, uh, international, uh, the ISS National Laboratory Leadership and Management. Obviously scientists are there. This is a science meeting as well as commercial space companies who are working on platforms, engineering technology, as well as science, biotech, and biopharma. So it's a huge, uh, diverse group of individuals attending, but it represents the, the large community that makes up space science, space research, space exploration. So you're gonna see and meet a lot of different people. Next slide, please. In terms of the scheduling and logistics, the graduate poster session will be on Friday on November 11th. Joy Amasa is leading that and she will let you know if the, if, uh, the order of the posters. The undergraduate um, session is in combination with the high school and middle school poster session and that's on Saturday, November 12th uh, from 10 to 12. And for any of these um, two poster sessions that you may be uh, participating in, please reply if you are going to decline your invitation as soon as possible. Uh, we need to know the, that information in order to determine how many um, easels we need to have for, for posters. Also, um, please have your poster on your easel no later than 30 minutes before the start of the session, um, regardless of your poster number. You can put them up, in this case for the undergraduates the, day, the evening before, um, for the graduate students, you'll need to double check um, because you'll be coming off of the heels of the faculty uh, poster um, presentations. But anyway, make sure they're up at least no later than 30 minutes. Each poster will have a pre-assigned number um, that corresponds to a pinned number on the poster board easel. And then so pin your poster, obviously uh, below its cor corresponding uh, poster board easel numbers number. We should have pin, push pins uh, available for you to use. Um, also, and this is for the undergrads, but for the graduate students, please remember to check and remove your posters uh, when, you, when you've asked to. Um, if they're not removed by the time that we've asked them to be removed, um, then uh, an ASGSR staff or staff members um, will remove the posters and we'll have them available for you to pick up at the registration desk. And again, the meet the faculty session, which is open to all students, uh, will be on Saturday, November 12th from 2 to 3 p.m. And again, these are all central time. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what I want to make sure you understand is what is the principal focus and purpose of the poster session? I think a lot of students come in and they immediately think competition. You know, this is like a science fair. I need, the key is that competition. That is an activity that is associated with the post session, but the key focus of your session is your science. And it's to, for you to present and discuss your science 
the technology and the engineering uh, that you are working on your project and to educate others about your project and learn from others based on questions and discussion. This is the focus of the poster session, right? And regardless of whether we would have a competition or not, this is the main purpose of it, as I've mentioned before, is to teach you and for you to gain experience in presenting your poster. But also the, the other important part is you've got some great work you're doing and we wanna make sure the scientific world hears it and we wanna make sure that you can tell them about it, okay? Now, what to expect from the poster session? Again, this isn't the competition part. I'll talk about that in a minute. But is that for now, all even number posters will be presented first. All odd number posters will be presented second for the undergraduate students. High school, for the college students, Joya will let you know, Masa will let you know um, which order she wants to go in. Um, all meeting, all attendees of the meeting are invited to attend your poster session, your poster. Therefore, you're going to get a varying level of expertise and knowledge about the science and technology you're presenting from 100%, because that's the field they work in, to 0%. And it's your job to make sure everyone learns from that, regardless of their level of education, regardless of their level of knowledge of the field that you are presenting. And so questions and discussions could vary based on the attendee uh, diversity and who speaks to you. Um, due to all the posters or the posters of that group being presented at once, it can be very loud inside the room. So make sure you speak clearly and at a volume attendees can hear what you're saying. Also, more than one person may engage you at the same time for that group for that poster session. So you're essentially could be talking to a group of people. Make sure if you are, you look around and go, do you have any questions? What do you think? You know, engage everyone who is at your poster uh, in conversation. Okay, attendees, again, attendees, regardless of whether you're an undergraduate or graduate student, they're gonna assume you are the expert in the science and activity you're presenting. And you're gonna be treated in that manner. Um, so you're gonna be treated very professionally, not like, oh, this is just a student. No, you're gonna be treated as a colleague. Okay, you know, as I said, they know you're students, but they're gonna be respectful of you and your work. You know, you're presenting a poster because you have something important to say, <coughs> excuse me, and they want to learn about it. They want to hear it. Um, <clears throat> attendees will also assume you may want to learn more yourself. So they're expecting questions from you also. And remember, the discussions and questions are the key benefit <coughs> and points to participating in the poster session. Next slide. So expectations that we have for you, practice. Practice your talk. Uh, practice your poster. Now, what we don't want is something where you're reading like a script and you've got it memorized. You know, practice your presentation so you get comfortable talking about your science, you know, and, and you're, you're talking in a, in a natural, genuine manner. Uh, Alvaro will talk to you a little more about that during his presentation. Um, but, you know, really also have someone who doesn't know your science or work at all listen to your talk so you can get comfortable with someone who doesn't know anything and is gonna ask questions that could be way out in left field. Or, you know, and, or you can find out if, you're, if you are understandable for what you're talking about. So practice. Also try to engage attendees at your poster. You know, if you're unsure of a question, ask for clarification. Ask questions back to advance and improve your knowledge or your advice or get advice and, uh, and, and guidance. Avoid pretending to know the answers. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. Or say, you know, but I do know this, you know, kind of bring it back. And when discussing a poster, as I, you know, uh, you don't have to have that definitive finding or discovery. It could be almost um, anything, you know, it can be inconclusive data. But what's most important is that you are talking about it. Someone may have some ideas of what to do, think about, or maybe an idea that you can think about. So your goal is that for these things are that the attendee comes away with new knowledge and interested in the science you're pursuing and they learn something. Also, you advance your own knowledge and get ideas and improve your technical presentation skills. Uh, next slide, please. For the competition, what to expect. Now we'll talk about that. The judges are gonna be responsible for determining if they wanna identify themselves. So some post judges may say, hey, I'm a judge. That, that will quiet everybody down because they're gonna to wanna to hear, or they may not. 
And in a real world experience with competitions at higher levels, you, you know, at, with your graduate student or other venues, they don't announce the judging. So this is a chance to give you real world experience. All the judges are volunteers. So you may get judges who know a lot or don't. Uh, they could ask questions that you would assume they should know the answer. But in reality, they may be someone who doesn't know and they're asking a genuine question to understand. Or it could be someone who's asking a question to find out if you really know what you're talking about and you've done your background preparation work and you can answer those questions. So answer a question without any prejudice, just answer. Okay, posters are all judged and scored on their own merit. Um, they're not compared. And also all the posters are judged at the same times, time. Now remember, judges are not expecting formal structured presentations like a science fair. They are expecting to have a conversation with you to learn about your posters. So clear communication and genuine interest in engaging ten the attendees is very important and telling to the judges. Next slide, please. Okay, come to the poster session well prepared in practice, as I've mentioned before. Remember that others are likely to have conducted the science that you're studying, so you may come across as, hey, no one's ever done this or NASA needs to do this. And the person you're talking to says, we've done that. So can you tell me what's new about what you're doing? Why is it novel? Or how is it advancing the science? You know, so make sure you've done your homework in terms of what you're presenting. Uh, you may get questions that are completely irrelevant, as I've mentioned, and are nonsensical. But again, this could simply be um, something that they're asking because they're what they want to know, or if it's way out left field, work to draw your per the person back to your story or consider it as maybe out of the box thinking and you might want to ask some further questions. Also formal and semi formal uh, attire is not required just dress nicely and professionally, but you can avoid but avoid wearing jeans t shirts sweatshirts you know sort of lounge wear or comfort wear. All right, and remember, this is your science of investigation so be proud of your work and accomplishment. You know, and show excitement and, and to communicate the research investigation to the community. Uh, next slide. All right, if you can just flash through, there's four that come up. Yeah, just go ahead and go through there. So again, have fun, enjoy your participants at ASGSR. These are really unique times and, and enjoy yourself. Be curious, ask questions, meet and talk with your fellow students and also challenge yourself at the end of the day to learn something new and ask yourself what would I do to advance the state of knowledge and technology from what I'm hearing from the talks, going to posters and other things, okay? Uh, and my, finally, my last slide. And oh, I just go ahead and click both, Chad. Now, you are the Artemis generation, the future of our space exploration, science and engineering uh, community. The Artemis generation is the one who is going to the moon, who is then going on to Mars. And this is you, this is your time, this is your generation. Um, as you uh, grow in your career, in your science career, or whatever you do. So we at the ASHR are really looking forward to meeting you and hearing about what you have to say. And that's it. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, everyone. And now I'd like to introduce um, Alvaro, who will be speaking about uh, posters. Well, th thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, Chad, I will try to share my slides just to be a bit more dynamic. Uh, my connection is back, which is great. <laughs> so here we go. Perfect. Uh, so well, welcome everyone again to this kind of crash course on poster presentations. Here we have undergraduate and graduate students. So I bet that many of you have already participated in this kind of activities. So some things that I will present right away will be a bit, um, will, will be a, a really familiar to you, hopefully. If not, uh, this is why we're doing this, right? So uh, first of all, my name is Alvaro. I'm an assistant professor at Georgia Tech, and I prepared this also as, as president of the Student Society of ASCSR that I encourage you to join, because it will open you the door to this amazing community. Regarding the poster presentation, which is the main topic of this talk, you should expect something like this when you get to present your poster at ASCSR. So you will find yourself in a big room surrounded by other poster presenters and a lot of people walking around, right? I always compare this with a flea market. 
So you are you have your tent in the middle of the street, and you want everyone to take a look at your uh, at your particular presentation, and you want to do it in such a way that they live with a very good impression of your work and potentially offer you opportunities for collaboration or uh, maybe job uh, job um, advice or any other sort of, of benefit to you, right? And we'll talk about that in a second. You will stand next to your poster and you will present sometimes repeatedly the same content to everyone that is uh, walking and getting interested by, by your poster. So there are two phases here. The first phase is getting everyone uh, close to your poster and the second one is delivering your message. And that's what we are gonna talk about today. So there are some key questions that many of you will probably have in your mind right now. Like the first one is obviously, why do we do this, right? Why do we go through the trouble of preparing a poster and, and delivering it and, and spending so much time on this? What does a, a good poster look like? Or how do I deliver my message? Or how do I attract people's attention? And, and also, as I mentioned before, how do I make sure that everyone reads my poster? So let's start with the first question. Why do we do this? Well, the first answer to this is usually to get feedback on your work from experts in the field. Maybe you are really an expert in your field, but even if you are an expert, it is always useful to have conversations with other researchers because that will give you new ideas and potential uh, opportunities for collaboration with those uh, well-established researchers. I have seen many students uh, in the ACSR society um, getting new job opportunities or career guidance in this sort of events. Uh, and less, not, not less important, you, we do this for fun, right? If, we, if, if virtual conferences were um, nice for everyone who participates on them, we would still be doing virtual conferences. But the cool part about being in person in this sort of scientific events is that you get to interact with people. And there are many long-term friendships that happen in these sort of settings and, and many useful scientific exchanges that you can benefit from. So don't forget, have fun. That's the most important part probably of any sort of, of conference you will participate. There is another aspect that distinguishes a poster presentation from any other, other sort of scientific, uh, scientific communication, which is that a poster presentation is an opportunity to interact with people in a personal setting. So you will stay there for one hour or even more time, and you will have the opportunity to talk with maybe someone who has been 50 years working in the space field and, and that know everything. And there is no other setting or no other possibility for us to interact with those, with those sort of very well-established researchers, right? So take advantage of that. Try to learn as much as possible in that hour that you stay in front of your post. With these very high-level guidelines, I would like to go to more uh, practical stuff. So how to essentially what I want to, to teach you, and this is largely based on my own experience, is how to leave everyone impressed with your work. Okay. So there are a few rules that you need to follow. And the first rule is follow the rules. No matter which scientific conference you are participating in, they will always provide you with some guidelines. Some conferences even give you um, 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 poster template, which I don't like particularly, but uh, that, that is the way that is the way it is. So the first thing you need to know is where you are going, right? So get to know the ACSR program, get to know who is going to be there, adapt your message to that audience, and follow the rules. And the only rules that matter in ACSR is to have a maximum poster size of four feet by four feet. Don't get beyond that because you won't find the space to put your poster. The second rule is to use a logical layout in your design. So humans tend to be tricky in the sense we have the bad habit of reading from the top to the bottom of the poster. So keep that in mind. Don't put the conclusions before the introduction, right? Always follow this, this sort of uh, layout because your readers will benefit from it. Use sections, use columns. Columns are extremely useful in a poster. Follow a logical order for the figures. And if, and you know, if you are a bit lost here because you have never done any sort of graphical design, a good idea is to follow one of these basic layouts, uh, like for portrait layout, four columns, large central box. In every case, the most important part of your poster is always the results, right? Conclusions are a few lines. Introduction and methods are, you know, people may be interested, but it is not the core of the poster. The core of the poster is the results that you want to present. 
The third rule is that you must always remember that a poster is a visual medium. This is not a, a scientific uh, article that you just copy paste into your poster so that people can read your article while they are standing your, in front of your poster. That you have a few minutes to convey your message. And if you fill your poster with text, uh, you won't be able to convey that message. Don't overwhelm your audience with text. It is important to leave blank space. Blank spaces are a powerful tool. They are like silence in music. Okay, you need to go, you, you don't you need to make sure that people is not overwhelmed by by all the information you put in your poster. There is another key uh, rule that you need to follow, which is that the poster must be readable from six feet away. And a good way to help doing that is to use sans serif, sans serif fonts because they are simplified with respect to serif fonts like Times New Roman. So use something like Arial for, for your poster. And um, structure your test, okay? Use bullet points, colors, tables, uh, things that actually help you convey your message and the structure of your work just by looking at it. Don't, don't make people look for information in your, in your poster. That is not gonna work. That people will have to visit 30 to 40 different posters in one hour. And you want to make sure that they are interested in reading yours, that they can get the message from your work very, very fast. Okay, so make sure to structure your test very well. Regarding the figures, don't please don't present a poster without figures. They are the core of your work. They convey a lot of information very fast, include plots, drawings, pictures, everything you can uh, you can use and make sense to convey the information, the key information of your poster. The other day I had this uh, this presentation with my own students where they had to tell me things about the environment of Mars, right? So some teams decided to, to present everything in a paragraph, like, like something like the temperature of Mars is whatever at the North Pole in the equator reaches this value and the variation between different seasons is whatever, right? But some other teams decided to plot the temperature profile of Mars on top of the planet, right? The big difference between these two things is that one solution is faster and looks nicer. So always try to convey the information using making a smart use of your plots. Uh, another tip that I can give you is please try to use colorblind safe color maps. A surprisingly large percentage of the population has a color color uh, blind uh, issues, right? So they cannot perceive colors in, in the same way as we do, or at least as I do. So try to use colorblind safe color maps. I give you a tool here, here called Color Reviewer. Uh, this is particularly useful not only for your poster, but also for articles and for plots, right? So you want to make sure that people can distinguish the different lines in your plots, no matter if they have some sort of visual impairment. And the last point, point number five, that is the key. You use eye-catching images. Right? So imagine this, you are in a flea market. What, what attracts your attention when you are walking in front of a, of a tent in a flea market? This that thing, that shiny thing, that flashy thing that the, that the, the business people have in, in their tent, right? That, a lot, that catches your eye. It can be some lights, it can be some um, a teddy bear, whatever, right? You need something that attracts people's attention. And all good posters, that you will see have this sort of mechanism. Some people choose to use objects like iPads, videos, and so on. I don't particularly recommend you to do that uh, because they are uh, tricky to operate, right? So you, you will, I mean, it is good that you have some sort of hardware because people will like it, but don't be moderate when, when you try to use uh, tricks in your poster, right? Usually an eye-catching image is the way to go. You want to be very effective. So ultimately, what you want to do here is that the poster should support and not compete with your explanation, right? So the, the poster should help you present your research. And this leads me to the uh, final, to the fourth point, the fourth and final point. You need to do your part of the job. A mistake I used to make here was to uh, focus too much on having a very nice post, uh, poster uh, in, for, for my scientific presentation, and I forgot to practice my own speech, my own questions and answers, right? So don't expect the poster to tell your story. You are the only one who can tell your story. And the more personal, the more um, uh, specific you make it, the better. You will need to explain everything that you are displaying in your, in your poster. You will need to be prepared to answer questions. 
And as Kevin said, and I, I would like to emphasize this point, yes, you will need to be persuasive. You will need to be convincing. You will need to practice, 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 and practice again your elevator pitch in front of your poster. But remember, when someone is not genuine, we know it, right? When you're talking with someone and, and you realize that that is fake, you know it. So the best way to do this is do not practice the test of your presentation. No, I, I, something that I always do is I, I take a sheet of paper and I start writing down the points I want to convey, right? But I don't write down the exact words I'm gonna use to convey those points. Every time I give a presentation in front of a poster or, or in front of an audience, that presentation is different. But I, I make sure that I send always the same key messages, okay? So try to be, persuasive and convincing, but don't sound like a robot. And the best way to do that is don't memorize your test. Keep in mind what you want to convey, the message that you want to send across your audience, but don't memorize that. Uh, and of course, prepare, you know, uh, you need to be, uh, when you are delivering this presentation, you need to be the person in the world that knows most, the most about your poster, right? And that is uh, key for you to, to convey your message. So remember, the poster presentation is as much about you as it is about the poster itself. Let me give you some good and bad examples for different posters. So let's start with this one. This is a very bad example of, of an example of a very bad poster. Okay, there is far too much text in here. The, the actually there are almost 800 words in front in this in this screen. If, if I am in front of this of this poster, I would just run away scared because I know I don't have time to read everything. So I just skip it, right? There is nothing here that attracts my attention. The background image is distracting. I strongly encourage you to use plain colors. The, te the test boxes are disorganized. They have background colors that make no sense. And they, they have different spacing between them. There is really not a lot of organization in this, in this kind of uh, layout. Um, what else? The fonts are completely inappropriate for a poster presentation. You have this uh, artistic title that really is completely distracting you from everything, right? You want to use something much simpler than this. There are many, many logos around or images that have convey actually no message, right? So you have this little cute thing in here, but this is telling you nothing about the research. So when you use an image, that image has to be used for a purpose, for something. Don't use images for the sake of using images. Um, then the science is really bad, right? You can see that most of the poster is introduction, which is not related to your work. And the results that are here in, in some part of the poster actually occupy a small box that tell nothing about your work. Sometimes it is fair that you, if you want to talk about your experimental setup, that's completely fair. But uh, don't, don't spend too much space on the introduction or, or abstract. The abstract is you presenting the, the poster. There are some good examples here to take as a reference. This is one of my favorites. So you have an eye catching image on the top. And that, by the way, is extremely pretty. And the test is, uh, the, the, the abundance of test is, is very limited, right? So there is not a lot in here. You can read this poster in two, three minutes. The explanation can last one minute. And all the messages are sent to your audience. There is a smart use of graphics and images in here that you can benefit from. In this other poster, there is quite a bit more of text. The font size is a bit too small for my taste, but hey, you have a, a very nice eyes, uh, eye catching image. And if you are only barely interested in crafts, this is going to be for sure some, a poster that you're going to read. The use of colors is very consistent across the poster. The color maps are very, very well thought here. In this other example, I don't like so much the color maps. They're a bit divergent. And the, there is probably far too much text, but they have a graphical abstract here that is actually very cool and that will attract people's attention. These are some examples from my own posters. This is the, these are the ones I did when I was an undergrad. So you can see here, my, my sister is a scientific illustrator, so she helped me a lot with this. So here you can see the eye cats and image is the drop tower where, where I run my experiments here and here. There is a logical layout. There is a reasonable amount of test. There is a good use of resources, of graphical resources to convey information, right? So try to do this. If you're interested in reading more about this, and, and the, there is this nice plot, a nice uh, post that I found on great posters. There is a blog also at nature.com on how to use um, graphical resources for your, for your presentations. 
And there is also a great book out there called The Craft of Scientific Presentations. That is habitual, you can see that it is old when you read it, but the recommendations that they provide are perfectly current, right? So this is a great reference for you and for your future as scientists. And as Kevin, if you have any questions, we will be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like now to introduce Nana, uh, who is a professor at Toronto, although you are now at Boston, right? So, uh, and she has just come back from her sabbatical and she's also a musician. So very, very interesting person. Thank you, Nana. I will stop sharing now. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad that you're here. If you can just, I'd like to know the audience. So if you can write in the chat, um, what school are you writing from? What degree you're working on? And if this is your first conference or if it's your 10th conference, just want to get a gauge of, of who's in here. So completely optional, but if you would like to provide that information, I would like to know who we're speaking to. So I'll give you a, a second or two. Chantilly High School. Aaron, where is that? Is that, oh, Northern Virginia. Cool. We have Aaron from Chantilly High School. Anyone else? I see people typing, so I'm going to wait. Oh, Barl is a musician too. He plays piano. <laughs> you know, Shima University, all the way from Japan. Are you in Japan now? It's really early in the morning now, isn't it? Um, 8 30 a.m. or something like that? <laughs> Very nice. And are you a graduate student there? From Hiroshima, a postdoc. Um, from Brazil, we have a postdoc from Brazil. Excellent. Um, first time attending conference. Is it Amon? 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 from a mechanical engineering, very nice, in New York. UMass, PhD, Will Cornell, PhD, wonderful. Excellent, graduate student, okay. So anyone in the audience, have you been to a conference already? Say yes, if you've been to a conference already. Any yeses in the room? Yes, okay. So for some of you, this may not be your first poster. For some of you, this may not be your first conference. So I just want to get a gauge of that. Wonderful. Thank you for your contributions. Um, I'm going to share my screen. The link is right there. The screen I want to share is um, I want you to find where you're calling in from. And there on this map, you should see the Indigenous peoples that uh, inhabit this land. So we want to take about 10 seconds right now to find where you live. And we're going to take 10 seconds of silence to honor the land that we are working on and living on and for our land acknowledgement. So we'll have 10 seconds of silence for that. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop that sharing. Okay. So I'm going to talk about how you can leverage conference attending um, for your own career development. And has anyone heard about the individual development plan that Science Careers has? If you have, you can just write in a quick yes in the chat if your school does that. There's a link to uh, the individual development plan. Okay, Marissa, yes. Marissa, do you use the science careers one or does the school provide you a school one? Just write a yes or unmute yourself. Oh, uh, yeah, so we have like, well, I haven't done this, and they provided just an example of what to do and how to structure one. So I've been like working on structuring in advance. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, so I'm going to go through that right now. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. 
And this is when you go to science careers, the first thing you see on the middle of the page is this individual development plan. So if you click on here, um, you make an account. Now I'm a returning user, but you'll be a first time user. And this actually helps you plan, not just for your own career, but also for your research productivity. And this tool can be used with undergraduates, with seniors in high school, with graduate students and postdocs. Because as, as you grow into a scientist, as a scientific thought leader, these are the skills you're going to have to know. So one of the things, as you go on the left-hand side, there's this menu. The first thing that you're gonna fill in is called the skills assessment. So if you go under skills assessment, there's a my assessment tab. And here you're assessing, you're self-assessing your skills. Okay, so one is you're highly deficient and five is you're highly proficient. Now, when you're using this tool, you want to give yourself some room to grow. So you can't give yourself fives for everything. <laughs> Maybe you are awesome in all these skills. So what you want to do is give yourself a relative rating. So let's say you say, okay, I'm going to say the CEO or the CSO, the scientific um, chief officer of a company is going to be a five, right? Or my tenured professor that I know is going to be a five in these things. So that way you have a gauge of where that five is and then you can gauge yourself on it. And so some of the skills that we all look for in a scientific thought leader that you are all achieving to be one day, that's why you're here. Um, so there's scientific knowledge. What's your broad based knowledge of science? The critical evaluation of scientific literature. And there's all these skills, research skills, communication skills, professionalism, management leadership skills, responsible conduct of research and career planning. So these are all the skills that you need to know to grow as a scientist. And you must give yourself an honest evaluation. And when you look at that, you can use this tool as a tool for mentorship as well, right? So let's say you go to research skills down in the middle of the page and you look at experimental design and you realize, hmm, I don't think I'm very good at that. It's, it's kind of hard for me to do that right now then you can take this individual development plan to your mentor, whether it's your supervisor, your committee members, um, someone that's teaching your class professor and say, you know, I rated myself low on experimental design or maybe a statistical analysis. So, and I want to know how to improve that. I want to know how to strengthen that. Okay. So now you have a tool to use for what I call mentee driven mentorship. And so you can use this to say, hey, these are the skills I need to work on. I'm gonna go ask my mentors how I can work on these skills. And then they can give you some advice because they know as opposed to, hey, professor, I need some help in everything. Right? That's hard for them to give you advice on, but now it's very specific on what skill you wanna be working on. The other assessment is the interest assessment. This is the second tab. And here is if you had an ideal job, rate how frequently you would be engaged in the following activities where one, in your future career, you would never like to do this. And five, in the future career, you would like to do it often. And so is it designing experiments, performing experiments, writing grant proposals? And these, all these things, this algorithm kind of takes into consideration when it gives you sort of this career match at the end. But the interest assessment, it'll change. For everyone, you know, maybe in your first year of grad school, you really don't like writing grants. Unless you're at the end of your PhD, you've become pretty established, or in your first, second year postdoc, you're saying, hey, you know what, I'm pretty good at writing grants, right? So this will change as well. So you should be taking this individual development plan probably at least once a year because you yourself will be growing. So there's a whole bunch of interests as well. And if you go to the values assessment, the values assessment is rate right how important it is to you that the future career match matches each of the following values, where one is unimportant and five is essential. And so if it's absolutely essential that you want to help society, you want to be part of Artemis, right? you want to be part of the next space age exploration, then that's gonna be essential, that's five. Um, but if you don't wanna have day-to-day -day contact with people, <laughs> Right? That could be a three. Right? So this is really, there's no wrong answer. It's your values on, on where you want to go. Right? So you fill this out. It takes about 15, 20 minutes. And then it gives you a summary. And then it gives you, if you go to a career fit, it gives you my career path matches. 
So down here, it gives you a list of all the possible careers out there. Uh, whether you're in space education, space research, whether you're in biotech that helps with space research, whatever that is, there's, you know, when we think of careers in science, it's automatically, oh, you're a doctor or a professor and you're researching. But there's a ton of other things that you can look up here. And just because you get a perfect match, it doesn't mean that's what you're going to be doing. You just want to know those are the careers that are out there. And then after you have the career path, what you want to do is there's a read about careers. So there's a whole ton of resources here if you want to read about more of these careers. And then attending events. So your attending events is going to be the ASGSR meeting that you're going to put in. It goes into your calendar. And then once you're there, you want to know, well, how do I talk to people? So it, it gives you tips on networking, on how do you network in a conference. The other thing I want you to look at is the informational interviews. So in the chat, can anyone tell me if you've done an informational interview? Anyone? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> um, so an informational interview is basically an interview, but it's the opposite. So Marissa is going to find a researcher at this conference and ask, may I have you know, a sit down coffee with you and ask you about your career pathway. And just as Kevin was saying, ask questions, right? The questions you're going to ask, and if you go down here, it gives you some sample questions um, that you might want to ask. But essentially, how did you get into your career? You know, how do you balance work life? Um, what was it like going through undergraduate, graduate school and postdoc? What would you recommend for a high school student wanting to do what you want to do one day? What would you recommend for a PhD student? So you want to ask questions that you want to ask you, right? If you had your ideal career five, 10, 15 years from now, and you imagine that younger self like Chad, the younger self is going to go to his Chad 15 years from now and say, hey, Chad, how did you do this? Right? That's what you want to be asking. What, who are your mentors? Who were instrumental in getting that first job? Right? That first job is not just about sending the job application, but it's also about who mentored you? Who gave you that, that connection? Who gave you that network that expanded your world? So that's what you want to be doing. And so when you're attending this conference, you want to look up in advance who is going to be there. Look up who is going to be there and ask yourself, do I want to work for this company maybe? Do I want to be an assistant professor just like Alvaro is doing? Maybe I'll go ask him for an information interview. And then before you even go to the conference, look them up, write an email and say, hey, there's a coffee break on Friday at this time. Can I meet with you next to the coffee? Or breakfast is a good time too. Um, so use the advantage of, of that information already being out there. It's in the program. You're going to go and set up the information interview before you go. Um, I'm going to stop there because we're going to take some questions. But thank you for your attention. And it was lovely to meet with you. Any questions? Thank you so much, Nana. That was, that was wonderful. And that's great advice. I wish I wish I had the power that I could go back 15 years ago and you know follow your advice and ask some of these questions to you know other people in, 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 the, in the science field. Um, but we can go into some questions now. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, there is one question in the chat thus far from Josh. And Josh asked, will space be an issue in front of our poster if we have six to seven members of our research group present? Does anybody want to try and tackle that question? Uh, yeah, I can. And Varo, please, please step in. Um, ideally, um, you're not going to want to have six people at one time trying to explain your poster. Um, it will be potentially tight depending upon where you are located. Um, Normally you would just have one person present, maybe two, but really one and the other five can um, either maybe engage other people who might be there um, to get more one-on-one. -on -one. You just have to be careful about how, how loud it is. 
or um, you can take turn who um, presents the poster uh, over time. But having six people standing around the poster um, is going to take up a lot of room. So the best thing to do is for you guys to take a look at how much space there is. And then uh, as you're putting up the poster or going the poster early on, and then figure out a strategy for how, for how you want to get all six of you of your team uh, involved um, without really squishing things down. Cause they're going to be posters across from you, obviously next to you, they're going to be a little spread out cause it's, it's going to be every other one, but six people in front of poster is a lot. So I would suggest think, think about a strategy of how you want to um, switch off over time. Of our, and and not Ken, only that. you guys have any suggestions? You want six people listening to your explanation, not six people explaining your poster, right? If I if I'm a, a poster judge as I have been over the years, and I just walk in front of your poster, I will be intimidated by seeing six people in front of the poster trying to present, it, right? So, so try try, try, try to try, don't don't do that. <laughs> it's not gonna work very well. It, Try to try to, to attract six or seven people to your poster so that they listen to your aspect. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say, Marissa, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Or Chad, did you want to? I was I was gonna weigh in really quick on that on that first question. I, I may suggest um, three groups of two presenting the poster, and you could you could just rotate. Maybe one group presents for twenty minutes, the next for another twenty, and the last for twenty just so you don't overwhelm um, that space because space definitely will be limited around your poster. And um, I think with that, we can go on to the next question, which Nana was just getting to. Um, <laughs> you want to address that, Nana? Yeah, Marissa, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I can. So you were talking about finding people to maybe do that in informational interview on. I was just wondering where we could see the attendees beforehand to be able to actually do that. Yeah, so closer to the conference, you will be receiving um, an app. I'm sure, I think we're still doing that this year. It's called conference.io. And on there, you'll see everyone that's attending. So if you have registered, you will have access to that as well. You can just scroll through and see who's going to be there. And then if you're not sure what they do, go to their name, see their title, go to LinkedIn, find out what they do, and there, there, there is the bio. That's really helpful, thanks. Sure. And there is even a chat in the app in case you want to reach out to someone. That was very useful last year. And, and also it may be that you could look on, on years past the conference presenters because a lot of people will come to this conference over and over again. It's a fairly uh, tight-knit community. so. And you can look into the past presentations as well. And if any of those interest you, you can um, you know, try and follow that person and, and try and tag up with them at the conference if they're there. It's not a guarantee, but uh, there's a, a decent chance that that same person would be at the conference this year as well. Are there any other questions? Uh, we have a couple more minutes before the hour comes to a close. Um, anyone else have? Anything come to mind throughout our three presentations? You know, I have you to say- You mute I'm, yourselves now. You are allowed to do it. Well, while we're waiting, I have to say that I do appreciate uh, Nana's 10 seconds of silence for the indigenous peoples across uh, North America. That's a really nice touch. I like that. Thanks, Chad. Well, if, if there's no questions, I suppose we can just wrap it up. Um, thanks everyone for attending and thank you all who presented. You guys did a wonderful job. And look forward to seeing everyone at the conference. I'm looking forward to seeing your poster. It's going to be a great time. Yeah, good luck on your posters. Looking forward Great. to that. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, and everyone. Luck. And we look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye. <laughs>